All right, well, first off, just a big thanks to Firstmark for having us here today, and really excited to chat with you all. I'm at Cohere. Cohere is a large language model provider. We partner with enterprises to give them leading generative and embedding models to build really amazing products, solutions, and features. I'm the director of product there. And today, I'm going to chat with you about what I am like most excited about in terms of where this technology is headed, which is the ability to solve complex problems. But before we actually get into the demo that shows that off, I want to look at what the technological developments have actually been over the course of the last few years. Because especially with AI, we talk about the future, and people have all these different ideas of how quickly it will come and what it will be. And actually looking at where we've been gives us a good insight into the rate of change and how it might evolve. So let's do it. In 2021, for those of you who are into Gen AI then, um, who is into Gen AI in 2021? A few hints. Who's into Gen AI now? More hints. Awesome. Um, you needed to do what was called few shot prompting, which is if you wanted the model to give you an output, you had to give it a few examples. So what does this look like? This was our actual user interface a couple of years ago. Um, and here, there's a prompt to a model. I give it a couple examples of the product and the keywords and what a good output looks like. Then I just give it the product and keywords, and I get at the bottom in bolded text that exciting product description. So at the time, this was mind-blowing, really exciting sort of next-generation capabilities. The problem is you don't want to have to do this every single time you're prompting the model. So in mid-2022, we're in the era of command or instruct models. Basically, what model providers did is they took a whole heck of a lot of high-quality data, which was examples of prompts, instructions to the model, and really good examples of completions, and trained those models to be able to follow instructions. And so we get models that you can give it an instruction, like write me a blog post about why everyone in New York should move to Toronto. And you get a high quality output. And you can click here for immigration. But what came next was sort of the like, light bulb moment for people who are outside of the space, which was chat models. And so again, we're taking those models, we're training it on a whole heck of a lot of dialogue data, and we get models that you can chat with. And I'm not going to show you an example of what a chat model looks like, because everyone's pretty familiar with it. But there was a problem that started to come up with people who were using it. And it's that these models would do this thing called hallucination, which is they'd give you the wrong info. And they'd sound really confident while doing it. And that's problematic, because if you're relying on this to make decisions, you need to know that the info is right. And so there was a solve to this, or something that could minimize hallucinations and give you more up-to-date, accurate responses, which is something called retrieval augmented generation. I'm going to keep the theme going. Who here knows what retrieval augmented generation is? Amazing. So I'm not going to explain it to you other than to give the very, very, very quick explanation, which is retrieval augmented generation, instead of having the model just give you a response after it's prompted, it enables the model to kick off a search on an external system or database, find relevant information, and the model is prompted with that relevant information. So you're able to get information that is grounded in an external data source. Example of a hallucination, if I ask who's going to win the Stanley Cup, and it says the Toronto Maple Leafs, we know that's not the case, unfortunately. So RAG is the beginning where models are components of the solution rather than the solution themselves. And while this sounds unexciting, this is a massive unlock for these models actually becoming hyper useful for us. What we saw with Dust in that first demo falls into the category of models as components of the solution rather than models as the solution themselves. And an example of a, a RAG question would be, I say, what was Apple's revenue last quarter? And what you see here is the model rephrases the search question to actually name the quarter. It's running a search over just the internet. And I get a response. Now, something you'll notice about the response is there's highlighted text. That means that text came from a data source. And I can look on the right-hand side and actually see what that data source was if I want to go and validate that information. That makes this way more usable. Softball, though, right? It's like a pretty easy question to answer. Anybody could have Googled it really quickly. Fair to say? Head nuts. We're on the same page. So this is where it gets really exciting for me, is what comes next. How do we have these models capable of solving really complex problems? So that then when they're alongside us during the day, they're able to do more than just give us the answer to the softballs. 
but really get into the weeds and be useful partners or problem-solving partners for us. And that's where we get to the multi-hop and tool use era. Probably needs a little bit of rebranding, but really it's about complex problem solving. And so I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. And just to name it before I start off, I'm going to prompt the model. And the model has access to a set of tools. Web search, web browsing, calculator, a weather API, it can just directly an answer me, or it can generate and execute Python. So I say to the model to create a plot of the number of full-time employees at the three most valuable companies in North America. If we look at what the model does first, is it tells me what it's going to do. So it says, first, I'm going to search for the three most valuable companies, then I'll find the number of employees, and then I'll plot the data. And it's already like moving forward faster than I can explain it, so I'm just actually going to pause this. And the first thing it does is it runs that initial search that it said it would. Then it, again, sort of checks in. It gives me a bit of an update of, here's what I found. Here's what I'm going to do next. And next, it's going to search for the number of employees at each of these companies that it found as the three most valuable companies in North America. So I'm going to come back to this and let it keep running. And so it runs an individual search for Microsoft, an individual search for Apple, and an individual search for NVIDIA. And then, boom, it lets me know what it's found. So I'm going I'm to pause it again, which is it finds the number of employees at each of these different companies. It runs the Python to actually create the plot that I asked for, because what I wanted was not the information, but I want it plotted. And so here's the plot that it creates. On the right-hand side, I can see the data sources where it found the information. And then I'm able to go ahead and download the plot. And to me, this is it's one of those moments that feels magical as we engage with this technology. But it's not magic. It's actually data. We're training these models in order to do the tasks that we need them to do. And the same way that we went from few shot prompting to command or instruction style prompts to chat data, to rag data, and now to uh, multi-hop and tool use in need of a rebrand. It's all about the data and how we're training these models. And so here's our plot. Looks very nice. And I just want to describe to you what's going on here. So I prompted the model. And the model creates a plan. The first step that it does is it creates a plan given the prompt and the tools at its disposal. Then it goes and does the first step of the plan. So it executes on that first step. Then after it's done that, what if it didn't find the right information? Or what if it found information that meant that the plan that it initially laid out was wrong? So the model actually reviews the prompt that I initially sent forward, the plan that it created, and the output of the first step, and adjusts the plan as necessary. And then it's able to move forward with the tools that it has access to, so on and so forth, adjusting as needed in order to respond with the outputs. This is early days. There's a lot of challenges that come when you bring this into production and a lot of work that needs to be done in order to make this work in an enterprise or a startup context. But this capability of being able to solve complex problems connected to tools, I think will change what it probably means for all of us to do our jobs within the next couple of years. And I can't imagine doing my job without the internet. I think people will feel similarly about not being able to do their job without their AI assistance. So that's the demo that I want to show you. Um, I am, for the first time ever, 55 seconds ahead of time. <laughs> and so we'll pause there and jump to questions. Thank you. Actually, just one quick question for me about that uh, New York office. Uh, what is it? Are you guys hiring? Uh, who's in there? All those things. Yeah, so it's a general purpose office. We've got technical folks. We've got business roles. We are hiring. We're having build day tomorrow where developers are coming in and actively building with our technology. And so if you're around and you want to come, let me know. And we can see if we can get more folks in. But we are hiring. And so feel free to reach out to me. I'm Jonathan at Cohere.ai. Fairly straightforward. And I can direct to the right places.